Okay, uh, now that we've actually proven the uncertainty principle on 3.5.1, uh, sort of the next jump that we're going to do is we're going to look at the case of minimum uncertainty. So we know that sort of the you know, uncertainty principle specifies that the standard deviation product of these two operators, whatever they may be, has to always be greater than or equal to h bar over two. Uh, and this sort of leads us to ask, okay, well, if I know that this is always true, in what sort of situation will I have sort of a system where the actual uncertainty, uncertainty relation is minimized, right? In what situation will sigma a times sigma b equal h bar over two? Right, and if I know that, maybe I can find out, okay, is there some sort of general guideline for systems that will have minimum uncertainty? And is there a way for me to be able to create these systems or be able to predict whether a system is going to have minimum uncertainty or not? So in that case, uh, there is a helicopter outside. Please give me one second. Okay, so is there a way for me to find out whether or not a system is going to have a generalized minimum level of uncertainty? So. Let's start by looking at what specific cases we've encountered so far that actually does have minimum uncertainty. And there's actually been two so far. The first one is the harmonic oscillator ground state, simple harmonic oscillator ground state. And if you want to go back and review that, this is problem 2.11. We found that this state had the minimum uncertainty relationship where uh, the uncertainty relation between position and momentum was in in fact equal to h bar over 2. Our second case was the Gaussian and this is for problem 2.21 if you want to look at this one where our wave function psi of x comma 0 was equal to some constant a times the exponential of negative a x squared. Uh, in this case, the position momentum uncertainty was indeed also the minimum value of h bar over 2. So uh, how do we find out generally, on a more general level, sort of what constitutes a system with minimum uncertainty? So let's go back to our proof, right? In 3.5.1, we use the Schwartz inequality to prove sort of the uh, the uncertainty principle. And what we got from 3.5.1, which I'm going to just skip to straight away, is that sigma a squared, sigma b squared, is going to be replaced with two arbitrary functions as inner products. So go back to 3.5.1 if you don't remember how this was done. And according to the Schwartz inequality, this is going to be in turn greater than or equal to the inner product of f with g magnitude squared. So our goal is to find out the conditions for which this inequality becomes equality, right? In what situation will this product become the smallest? And immediately I can tell you, okay, well, one way for this, for, for this expression to equal is if I just replaced one of these f or g functions as a constant multiplied by the other function. So let's say, suppose that g equals some constant at c multiplied by f. In that case, this becomes an equality, right? This becomes f, f, and then inner product of c, f, c, f. And this is going to be greater than or equal, in this case, straight up, just equal to the inner product of f with c, f, squared. The c is going to move out because it's a constant, so it's going to become magnitude c squared, and then the inner product of f with itself squared, which is exactly what this term equals, right? So this is where we can sort of minimize even further, because remember that when we were proving 3.5.1, one of the things we did was we sort of represented complex values as, you know, magnitude z squared is equal to the real component, magnitude squared plus the imaginary component, magnitude squared, and that this was going to be always greater than or equal to the solely the imaginary component, right? So we did this in 3.5.1. The reason why we threw away the real component, specifically instead of the imaginary component, is we recognize that, you know, in quantum mechanics, these quantities tend to be generally imaginary. If you wanted to prove it the other way by throwing the imaginary component away instead of the real component, I don't think that will work. I'm not 
too sure on the reason specifically why, but maybe if you feel like you're a smart little cookie, you can go and sort of try that proof out yourself and see why that sort of thing doesn't work. But uh, essentially in 3.5.1, we decided to throw away this real component in order to sort of make this value on the right even smaller, right? Because our goal is to make this as small as possible. So what we did was, okay, I'm going to assume that, you know, for any imaginary term, I'm just going to throw away the real component because that's just going to make this term smaller. So if I do that and I say, okay, suppose that this C value, which could be imaginary because, you know, we're dealing with imaginary functions. Uh, so if one function is a multiple of another, it's logical to assume that it, the C value could be purely imaginary. I'm going to say this is a purely imaginary term. So if that's the case, I'm going to represent C as just IA, right? So B plus IA, where this is the real term, this is the imaginary term. I'm going to throw away the real term, only leave the imaginary term. So C is going to equal IA. Uh, in that case, G is therefore going to equal IA times F, right? Whoa, my pen is messing up. Okay, there we go. G is going to equal IA times F. So remember that F in the first place was defined as the standard deviation, which we specifically define as a hat minus the expectation value of A acting on our wave function psi. So if we plug all of this into position momentum uncertainty, right? Well, the operator for x is just x. The operator for p is negative i h bar d by dx, right? So in that case, f is going to equal negative i h bar d by dx subtracted by the expectation value of p in terms of p. And this is supposedly equal to our g component with an additional ia factor at the front of x minus the expectation value of x, right? So basically th this is equal to this, this f term is equal to this, where f is related to the p operator, and this is in turn equal to the x operator version, which is defined as g, which is equal to ia times f, right? So this turns out to be a differential equation for psi. And its general solution, as we will see in problem 3.17, is going to be, so per problem 3.17, which I will do in a later video, but for now, let's just take our word for it. Uh, the solution for psi, when you know I look at this differential equation, it turns out that it's going to equal a times e to the negative a times x minus the expectation value of x squared divided by 2 h bar times the exponential of i expectation value of p times x divided by h bar. So this is a Gaussian, once again, so this sort of implies that the minimum uncertainty wave function for position and momentum takes on the form of a Gaussian. You can do this again for, you know, some other two pairs of, observ of observables, perhaps position and energy or momentum and energy, you would get a different type of wave function, blah, blah, blah. But specifically for position and momentum, it takes on the form of a Gaussian. And as it turns out, you know, these two examples we saw above, well, this is literally just a Gaussian. It turns out that simple harmonic oscillator ground states, or just in general simple harmonic oscillator states, take on the form of Gaussians as well. So that agrees with everything we've seen so far. And with that, let's move on to 3.17, where we prove sort of this, uh, this differential equation for psi, or I guess we solve it.